Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Future Frame TV. I'm Elise Crozer, your host on the Inequalities Channel, and uh, I'm here today. It's my great pleasure to be here today with uh, Dr. Laura Clancy. Hey, Laura. Hi. Laura is lecturer in media and inequality at the University of Lancaster in the UK. And Laura specializes on researching royalty and their appearance in uh, media of all sorts. And uh, we want to talk today about how royalty in general and the UK specifically interacts with media and how that influences or not inequality, what it has to do with inequality. So welcome to this new episode presented by Traces Dreams as always. Laura. Tell us about your research, please. So thank you for having me. So I um, I research the British royal family and I think about the relationship between the media representations that we see of the British royal family in Britain and also around the world in relation to them as an institution. So them as an institution of state and their relationship to kind of politics and these and wealth and these kind of big questions. So I think what in the UK, we kind of have these big conversations about inequalities and kind of, you know, widening inequalities as they are all around the world. But often the British royal family are completely kind of overlooked in those conversations. So they're not kind of considered in those same terms. And my argument is that we cannot talk about inequalities in the UK, at least, without talking about the British royal family. If we think about people talk about all the time about Britain, British people's obsession with social class <laughs> um, and of course that the you know the royal family are absolutely central to that you know the, the hierarchies of deference and stuff that are created through having a monarchy completely endemic to inequalities. Are the royal family a class by themselves or how would you place them on the British class system? I think they are a class by themselves I mean I think there are relations so I think one way we can look at them is part of an aristocracy. So kind of part of this kind of older traditional version of, of landed wealth in particular. Um, and again, people kind of have, have assumptions that aristocratic wealth has disappeared. And that isn't the case, actually. There's still a huge amount of aristocrats um, who have kind of diversified their portfolios to manage, to manage them in a time of you know, financial capitalism. Another way to think of the royal family is as part of the elites, and that's how I think of them. So in my book that is out in September called Running the Family Firm, I use this term, the firm. I call the royal family the firm, and I do that in order to describe them as a corporation. So to think about the ways in which they're kind of invested in reproducing wealth and reproducing power in a way that is comparable to a corporation like Amazon. So even if you think it boils down to, you know, we often talk about people like Amazon avoiding tax. Well, of course... The Guardian newspaper in the UK had the Paradise Papers that they revealed and the Queen's property portfolio, the Duchy of Lancaster, was revealed as also avoiding tax in those documents. So we can make direct comparisons between the, the royal family and the elites more generally as well. If you could talk a little bit more about your book, you introduced it already, uh, Running the Family Firm, out in September. You should definitely uh, pre-order it already now. We're all very much looking forward to, to receiving our copy. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the argument that you pursued there about the representation of the royal firm? Yeah, so I use this idea of the firm to kind of talk about them as a corporation. And I do a lot of kind of research about looking and thinking about what they, how it runs, what its operations are and how, you know, who, who works for them, what they do, what kind of wealth they have. Actually, that information is really difficult to find um, because the, the monarchy makes it really difficult for you to find that information, which is interesting in itself. And then I kind of have this two pronged argument, I suppose, where I talk about the front stage and the backstage of monarchy. So I say the backstage is all those things that I've described, their wealth, who works for them. And these are the things we don't normally see. What we do often see is these representations of a royal family with the emphasis on family. So we often see the queen as this kind of grandmother with her little handbag. Uh, we a often dog, see, a dog. Yeah, a dog. Yeah, yeah. We often see Kate and William and the children as this kind of very nuclear middle class almost family that they, they kind of portray. So I talk about the ways in which those media representations of a family mask those kind of backstage that is happening behind the scenes and those kind of representations. I suppose they, you know, they circumvent questions around wealth and power and political influence and all of these other important questions. Maybe we can contextualize this wealth uh, that you're talking about. How much wealth are we 
considering when we think about the royal family? How many people are they even, or how big is the firm, or you know, what what is the dimension of this of this beast? Yeah. So that's actually a really difficult question, <laughs> particularly in terms of wealth. Wealth is really complicated when it comes to the royal family. So they're funded by um, a sovereign grant, which is to kind of put it quite simply, I won't go into the full thing, but it's it's the Crown Estate, which is a, like, a portfolio of land and property that is owned by the Crown, not by the Queen personally, by the Crown as an institution, makes money from that from that land and from that property. That goes to the Treasury and the government, and then that will then, a, and a percentage of that will come back to the monarchy. What they have in addition to that, and that's what they claim is their official kind of funding, what they will have in addition to that is local councils who will pay for royal visits, Their security is funded by the Metropolitan Police. So there are these also these various other things that aren't counted in those official statistics in terms of how monarchy is funded. In terms of wealth, that's also really complicated because there's a difference between what the Crown owns as an institution, and that's separate from the monarch as in the Queen as a woman, and then there are things that the monarch personally owns in a personal property portfolio. And while we can account for what the crown owns, because it's public property, essentially, it's really difficult to account for what the queen owns, owns personally, because that's not public knowledge. And often kind of freedom of inf- information requests that you could ask to try and find that out. Well, actually, often the monarchy is um, exempt from those. So it's actually really difficult to find out exactly what they own. And there are various different figures that I cite in the book in terms of what they own that vary from millions to billions and it's, it's really difficult to kind of put a number on that and it also depends on what you're categorizing as wealth as well like that's a really complicated question which again we, are, we might want to say that's a problem in itself right that it's that complicated that we don't know what this institution that is so key to the British state owns and what they you know we don't know what they do essentially People is a little bit easier to answer. So there's about, there's different palaces and there's different people working for those palaces. The main one is the Queen Elizabeth Palace, which is at Buckingham Palace. And there's about just over a thousand people working in various capacities, whether that's kind of higher up, so like private secretaries or um, communications officers who would kind of, you know, be managers almost, I suppose, to, I suppose, more like butlers and things like that, that might be, they will be lesser paid, should we say. So there's kind of these different hierarchies of staff that work for them. How do you get this information? I mean, speaking about this complication of getting access, I mean, you don't have to reveal your secret sources, of course, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we all know. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> we all know, as researching people in the higher uh, echelons of this uh, power and wealth society, we, we know how difficult it is to get access and inf- information in general, right? But especially in this place where it's not only so secluded and separated from society in general, but also so protected with so many layers. How do you get information? You mentioned Freedom of Information Act and, uh, I don't know, public information and media, I guess. But uh, what is what is your strategy there? Yeah, so getting access has been it's been a problem all along. It's always kind of been part of this project. I obviously haven't interviewed any royals as much as I would love to. And I also wasn't um, able to get access to any of the one that worked for them. You know, when you start to work for them, you kind of have to sign these agreements that you won't you won't talk about the experience. So that wasn't also wasn't an option. So they're very kind of it's very tight in how they manage it. And again, that's probably on purpose. So we kind of don't see this front stage um, so don't see the backstage. Sorry. So the way I've got information is essentially just a really a massive series of gathering loads of information and cross referencing and trying to figure out what's right and what's real. So things like biographies of people who've worked for them have been were really useful and that kind of led down other paths. Things that have been released, so papers, so things like The Guardian when they release those Paradise Papers and then they kind of release the papers that they came from and you can kind of go down that avenue. Also really weird things like on the internet, so things like LinkedIn. <laughs> like There are ways to kind of get information on there and then cross-referencing that is obviously really important um, and looking at like, histories of I kind of looked at like, ancestries of peers and stuff because there's a lot of peers that work for their royal family so I looked at that quite a lot so it's kind of this complicated like I, I kind of call it like investigative journalism it's almost what it is so kind of piecing together all of these different things to try and work out what's what's true And they will often announce who was working in key areas. So they'll announce who the private secretary is, for example. And then you can go and research that figure yourself and kind of find out who it is. So there are ways to, and I'm not claiming that I know everything. I, I definitely don't. There's definitely things that are still hidden. But there are kind of ways to get a bigger picture by doing that kind of research. What is the importance of getting this bigger picture? I mean, we could just say, okay, it's the royal family. They're interesting, maybe, because royalty always has this idea of glamour or or secrecy or 
curiosity around it, right? But what do you think is the larger importance of researching, of, of knowing, uh, as everybody knowing more about what's going on behind the scenes? It's really interesting, that question, because when I, when, as I've been doing this project, I've been asked quite a few times, like, well, what's the point? What's the point of researching the, the British monarchy? Or um, people have I've had someone say to me, well, you know, there are much more important things to worry about. Like, there are people living in poverty. Like, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I kind of said that, you know, royal, the, the monarchy is absolutely central to all of those issues. Like, in Britain, to talk about inequality without talking about the monarchy is completely missing such a huge part of how inequality is kind of shored up, right? So how wealth is shored up and how these systems of privilege are shored up. And when you kind of look into it, you see that the monarchy has all of these connections to these various corporations, to these really powerful individuals. You know, they, a lot of their charities are sponsored by, you know, really big like HSBC, for example, like, you know, these really big corporations. So thinking about those relationships and we know, you know, from other people's research that, you know, elites often kind of run in these really tight knit networks. And actually the royal family are absolutely central to those networks and to shoring those up. So if you think about what, you know, when the Queen gives out, honours right so OBEs or whatever that whatever it might be that is a way of kind of creating that relationship of value between the monarchy and between these broader systems of power as well so these are always happening so my answer would be that you know you you can't talk about inequality in Britain um without talking about the royal family and actually the, the issue of people living in poverty and the monarchy are not separate they're absolutely part of the same conversation I like uh, what you say about these uh, tight knit networks because that uh, links very nicely to the front stage that you uh, also uh, research in your in your work. The representation of the family as something, as you say, um, you know, family, <laughs> as something almost middle class. You mentioned uh, what is the purpose behind this specific representation of uh, something so powerful as something kind of cute and small and maybe inoffensive or. I think there's, there's, there's obviously historical ideas of monarchy and power, which would traditionally be a king. And if you dare defy the king, you would get your head chopped off, essentially. Right. So it's for this very kind of top down version of power. Nowadays, of course, that doesn't work. So nowadays, how that will work is through the media and the way to, as Stuart Hall would say, produce consent for this institution is through the media and is through those kind of representations. So it's. This particular, I think what, what we're seeing is the money kind of leaning in to this kind of contemporary discourse of, it's almost like meritocracy and this idea of like ordinariness and this idea of it's not about hereditary wealth and it's not about hereditary power. You know, we deserve to be here. And you hear it often, you hear you heard it in the, in the Harry and Meghan Oprah interview that happened recently, right? This idea that they work, it's a job, right? They go out and they do, they do good work, they do charity work and they, they, are, they are providing value, they're producing value for the society because they're going out and doing these things. So it's, again, that's a, that's a kind of legitimation tactic and that you're not kind of asking, well, why are they being funded for sitting around doing nothing in a palace? Because they're not, Important right? They're going point, out. They're funded. They're funded. Yes, <laughs> yes, they are. By what is, in a roundabout way, it's not precisely, but in a roundabout way, it is public money, essentially. So it's a, it, there's, there's got to be a way of legitimating that, right, in contemporary society, because you can't, it doesn't, it doesn't pass anymore. <laughs> that logic doesn't pass in 2021. So you've kind of got to, the, the ways in which that's got to kind of be rewritten. And that is done through kind of charity work, through saying, look, we're, you know, we're producing value, we're doing these things. It's also done through the idea of the family and through this idea of ordinariness and, like you said, this middle classness. So it's about not what we don't see is this really, or we don't often see, I should say, these really kind of ostentatious displays of privilege anymore. We kind of see them as this kind of ordinary family and we see that when people marry in. So Kate Middleton for example, marrying in. So important to, again, produce the idea of meritocracy, right? Because here's the monarchy. So open itself up to the middle classes, like it's available. You, you can access it if you want to. So it's part of that narrative and it's part of showing that they are that they are normal and they're ordinary and they're relatable and there's kind of something tangible about them. And part of my argument is that there's this constant balancing act between visibility and invisibility. And that's really key. So you have the the really kind of um, almost like hyper visible representations in terms of state ceremony. So that might be kind of um, jubilees or royal baby births or royal weddings. And then you have a visibility in terms of these things, in terms of the family, in terms of charity work that you'll see in the media. And then that hides this level of invisibility, which is the kind of operations. So there's this constant balancing act between 
enough visibility so you're kind of producing consent and you're keeping yourself in the public in the public eye but enough invisibility that you're not kind of tipping that balance and getting people to start to ask questions. And what was really interesting about the Harry and Meghan Oprah interview is that they completely, un- like, like, temporarily, it completely unbalanced that because people started asking questions about the institution. And I want to come back to that in a moment, but before I'd like to ask you, how how real is this image? I mean, of course, it's a constructed image, right? Uh, especially coming back to this middle class idea, Kate Middleton coming in from, is she just an average person that happened to, you know, be lucky? Or do we have to accept that actually the royal family is open to the middle classes? Or is this also, I mean, of course, this is a kind of leading question, but is there, is there some, <laughs> some trick behind that? No, I think that's absolutely true. And I think we know that Kate Middleton's family are multimillionaires. She's not middle class at all. And that also, I mean, she's relatively to the monarchy. <laughs> she maybe is. Fair enough. Fair but if enough. we're talking in terms of like wider society, no. Like a family, you know, a family of multimillionaires, she went to private school. You know, there's still those systems of privilege at work. So it's still a very kind of constructed version of access, I suppose, in terms of the type of people that can access. And again, we might want to talk about Meghan Markle here because, of course, what we've seen recently is that that, that kind of entrance didn't work because they, she kind of may perhaps, again, unbalance that slightly too far. And they kind of couldn't keep hold of that because she raised so many questions around privilege and race and all of these really important questions. And I'm not saying that badly about Megan. You know, I think those are really important questions. She did kind of unbalance that for them, I think. Exactly. And, and that's where we come where we come back exactly to this to this interview. It, it, I think, well, from an outsider perspective, somebody not knowing much about the, the family firm at all, front stage or backstage, it looks like a little bit of a surprise that people are surprised that there is racism in the royal family. Um, yeah. However, you know, balancing with this uh, very successful, I'll like to say marketing of Kate Middleton as middle class and as the royal family opening, etc. Now they're approaching normal or average or larger societies suddenly seems to get out of hand or is not controllable in the same way anymore um, with Meghan Markle raising the issue of racism in there. Is there racism or, you know, should we be surprised or what's this discussion about? Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating what's happened. Um, and there's so many layers to it as well. I could talk about it all day. I won't, but I could. <laughs> so I don't know whether someone said what she said they said. I don't know. I, I don't have access to that information. I think you're right that it is, is quite amazing that people are surprised that there might be that the monarchy might be a racist institution, I think is the word. So if we think about, you know, history, the history of the, of the royal family, it's built on, on empire. It's built on, on colonialism. That's where, that's where a lot of their wealth came from. It's where a lot of their wealth is, you know, they, they still have a lot of that wealth. And it's an institution that is built on white supremacy, essentially. You know, it's, it's, it's 20, whenever it was 2018 that she married in and it was our first woman of colour in the monarchy. Like, that's not really something to shout about, is it? Yet it was. But they tried. So I think, you know, there are these much broader structures and people want to reduce it to conversations about individuals and they want to know, well, who said that, you know? And I'm not saying that's not important that we do know that when it's when it's someone that might be, that might possibly be a monarch one day. But I think there are also these bigger questions in terms of an institution and the kind of the infrastructure of the institution, right? So when we talk about inequalities, it's often the institutions that we need to think about, not the individuals. And I think boiling it down to, as I've seen often, like Team Queen versus Team Meghan, I don't think that's particularly helpful. I think what, what we need to ask is, you know, this, in- this, this institution that is built on colonialism and built on white supremacy that is still at the, you know, the, the top tier of British society, essentially, and that has now been implicated in this whole discussion around the way in which a woman of colour was treated when she dared to marry into this family um, in the British press as well and how they, the, you know, the, ta- the tabloid press, how they treated her. So I think I think I think it's those questions that are more interesting, and I agree it's not it's not particularly surprising that there might be these issues, given these histories that we know about. What is the what is the role of media in general in in these discussions? I mean, they are quite actively enforcing one discourse or another, I suppose. And I mean, they have a very active or very powerful role also in precisely being the the kind of gatekeepers of this discourse, right, or promoters. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think 
royalty and media is a really interesting question because there are and prince harry alluded to this in the interview which was i think one of the most interesting things because he called it like a, a hidden agreement i can't think what his words were but it was something that was that's paraphrased but an agreement between the monarchy and the and the, and the press and I think, you know, we have people like royal correspondents in the UK. So these are journalists that will just report royal news and they'll be attached to a certain media outlet. So, for example, the BBC will have a, a royal correspondent. And then when you put that alongside as a foreign correspondent or a politics correspondent, what you're doing is you're attributing equal weight to royal news as you are to foreign affairs or wars or whatever else might be going on in the world, which is in itself a problem. What there is also is a royal rotor system. And the Royal Rota system is an agreement with journalists where journalists from particular outlets will get, it says they'll get more access to royal events because they're from that particular outlet. So there's there's kind of, the BBC is on there. There's quite a few of the tabloid, the tabloid media is on there. A few of the broadsheets, uh, the press association, like those kind of big, those big, big organisations. And they'll get closer access to royal events than other other journalists will on the on the agreement that they'll then pass that footage onto the others but what you're doing then is you're creating this structure where some media outlets get more access than others and of course then you're you're influencing then if that outlet has a particular type of politics you're then influencing what kind of things will be reported as well so i think you know the media I mean, the media is interested in itself in that the media in the UK has a problem of racism. It does. Tab the tabloid media certainly does. And a problem of sexism that's longstanding. The way they treated Meghan is um, you know, part of a very long history. I'm thinking of someone like Amy Winehouse, for example, you know, how she was treated in the press. But the media and royalty, I think, is a, is a, is a related but separate discussion that because of these kind of hidden agreements and things that they have. Um, and there's these two things in the Meghan and Harry thing. You've got these two things kind of coming together, I suppose, and clashing um, because the people that the monarchy would normally rely upon were some of the people who were printing these headings, these headlines that were racist and sexist. From the outside, I mean, out of Britain, of the British context, it looks kind of funny that there is such seriousness about this. I mean, me having grown up in a country where there's no royalty, how important is royalty still today? And, and how important is it for, for the public or for British society? I mean, in terms of how serious do we have to take it? Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if... So we know the Queen is incredibly popular. All the polls show that the Queen is really popular. And we know that people on the whole don't support our republic, that they support the monarchy. I wonder, and from this isn't from necessarily from data, it's more from kind of discussions and things, things I've seen on the internet and that, you know, a kind of informal data collection, that it's not so much that people love the royal family and they're really into it. It's more kind of an ambivalence. So it's more this idea that they kind of, well, it goes back to what I said earlier, that they don't really see the point. <laughs> they don't really see the point of thinking about it because they're just there. Um, and it's why, why, why mess that up? Why change things? Because they're just there and they're operating. And they don't see why it's important to think about it. They think there's more important things to worry about. It goes back to exactly that same point. So I think that's the key. And I think there are obviously are some people who are really, really ardent monarchists like that does exist. But I think on the whole, people are just are just quite ambivalent and just kind of go along with it. So I think the question isn't kind of people taking it seriously. I, th I think the question is people not not taking it anyway, kind of just taking it as it is and not kind of thinking about that. And the Harry and Meghan thing obviously fractured that temporarily when everyone was wanting to talk about it and it was everywhere. That's dipped off now. You don't you're not hearing about it as much. And we have these kind of flashpoints in history, like Princess Diana, for example, everyone was talking about it. But then everything just dips down and everything carries on as it, was, as it was. So I think it's more the question of, well, how can we help people to kind of see that? And how can we get people to ask these questions rather than it being kind of addressing that people love it so much they don't want to see it disappear? So the question is rather to look at specific aspects of it much more and take them much more serious. Yeah, like, for yeah, example, yeah. their backstage. backstage. Yeah, exactly. Draw attention to the backstage. That's how I would put it. So it's about not just kind of letting, ha, ha, giving people an outlet to not just look at the front stage. And of course, the, the backstage isn't often reported. Like people don't know, like people would, I don't think most people could tell you how the, how the monarchy was funded or I can't even tell you how much wealth the Queen has. <laughs> like, so it's having a lot, right? right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think about this all the time and I can't even tell you. So it's making people aware of aware of those facts, I think, and having those conversations and also having a conversation about what a republic might look like. I mean, that's 
And I can't necessarily provide an answer to that because the, the answers aren't out there, like the options aren't out there. So it's having a conversation around what that might look like and how that might be better as well, I think. It's interesting because, for example, in a country like uh, Spain, where there is a lot of uh, criticism recently, much more open, there is actually a discussion about, about in Belgium as well, about abolishing or the, 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 well, mm. the king retreating himself or in, in the Spanish case, people wanting to get rid of the institution at all. Uh, or, or overall, and uh, that doesn't seem the case in in Britain. There is a lot more. I mean, the ambivalence is more on a private level, maybe, but it's not. There is not really a movement to abolish royalty in the UK, is there? No, no. The Republican movement is really small. It's a really small organization. You don't often see it on the, on TV. They don't often kind of get on to on to prime time TV or anything like that. But yeah, there just isn't that appetite. Whether that's because people don't want to or whether that's because there isn't an opening for people to start thinking about that because it's not talked about, that's I think that's a hard question to answer. But is there a, a specific benefit to having them for the people in general? I mean, besides, you know, media stories or tabloid stories? My answer would be no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. To put it really, to put it really bluntly, I mean, people, people have all sorts of de kind of defences of this. Republic, if you kind of go on their website and they have loads of these facts that are publicly available, it's a great website, and they kind of debunk all of these myths essentially around why we should keep monarchy. So people will often say, well, you know, they're really good for tourism. Actually, if you look at like the Palace of Versailles in France, they get more visitors. So it doesn't just because we have a living queen in the palace doesn't mean people would want to visit it any less if there wasn't. You know, and there's, there's kind of these various arguments that people make around why it's good to have them. And also people say, well, we wouldn't want a president. We wouldn't want a President Trump. Or in our case, a President Nigel Farage. I heard that the other, the other week, which we wouldn't. But that doesn't mean that we're going to get that. It, you know, there might be other options. So I think there are kind of ways to, when you look, when you boil it down, there are ways to kind of debunk quite a lot of those myths around why it's good to have a monarchy. Laura, this is a fascinating topic. But before we come to a close... I'd uh, love for you to tell me a little bit more about how you got interested in this subject in the first place. I mean, how do you come up, you know, wake up one day and want to look into the Queen's wealth or how was that? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I've never been hugely into the monarchy as in never been hugely for anti before doing this project. I started off thinking about Kate Middleton and thinking about gender and um, ideas of like traditional gender roles in the in in the aristocracy actually and that kind of led into royalty and then you I kind of just ended up in this wormhole which is where all the best research projects start of looking at you know all of these different facts and kind of spotted that and kind of noticed there was a gap I suppose like when I was trying to look for the literature I kind of noticed that this is quite there is kind of classic texts on the royal family that are really excellent Michael Billig's work Tom Nairn's work is really great but there isn't anything there's not much contemporary and there's not much it there's nothing in the kind of argument that I'm trying to make around power and wealth and inequality so really spotting that there was this kind of you know that the need that it was needed that this conversation was needed and when the more I kind of talked to people about it and they kind of said well why bother? That made me more kind of more determined to do it, I suppose. And more kind of, it kind of made me see that gap a little bit more, I suppose. And so it's kind of a roundabout way to get into it. And then I've kind of got, I've become, I've definitely become more of an anti-monarchist since I've done the project, which is quite interesting. Very interesting. And we hope that you get more interesting data and uh, make your follow-up uh, on the actual amount of wealth that the Queen has and, <laughs> and, and all the financing issues behind. Run to your new bookstore or internet shopping place or whatever and pre-order Running the Family Firm by Laura Clancy. Laura, thank you so much for this conversation. It was a pleasure to talk to you about royal family inequalities and uh, power behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, the media relation uh, and how this all comes together in the UK. Thank you everybody for watching another episode of Future Frame TV. We hope that you'll join us again next Saturday. In the meantime, you can subscribe to our channel so you can view all the other episodes. If you like this topic or if you want to learn more about inequalities, please leave us a comment about the subject that you would like to research. And we hope you have a nice afternoon and uh, see you again soon. I'm Alice Crozer, your host for the Inequalities channel presented by Traces Dreams.